This lecture is announced in the programme as summing up, but rather than waffle away about generalities, I thought it would be a good thing perhaps to talk a little bit more specifically. The last administrative announcement you see concerns questionnaires. Some of you have already returned questionnaires, some of you haven't. Please do so. Uh, let us have your views on the course. Hand it into the office any time today. But <coughs> from those questionnaires that have come in, I see various uh, things to which I can perhaps respond in this lecture. Some of you wanted to know about other varieties of English, apart from received pronunciation. So I can talk about that a little bit, and about the general problem of defining or circumscribing received pronunciation, RP. Because it is a very real problem. There, there seem to me to be three different possible ways of defining RP, which I've set out on the handout. <coughs> In the column headings, socioeconomic, ideal, or EFL. And this corresponds to three kinds of criteria for saying what is and what is not received pronunciation. The first is the socioeconomic criteria. It's often been pointed out that the way someone speaks in England correlates very strongly with two different things, their social class and their geographical origins. So that on the one hand, an accent can be described as an upper class accent or a working class accent, social judgments, and on the other hand, as a northern accent, a London accent, and so on, geographical. However, these two are not entirely independent of one another. Many books give you a diagram in the form of a triangle where we have social, social class differences as the vertical dimension and geographical as the horizontal dimension. The point being that in England, the higher your social class, the less likely your accent is to enable someone to locate you geographically. The lower your social class, the greater the geographical distance is. From this point of view, RP is an accent that has two special characteristics. Firstly, that it's socially upper class, upper middle class, the top of the social continuum. But secondly, perhaps more importantly, that it's non-localizable. It is not a Manchester accent, it's not a London accent, it's not even an Oxford accent, even though that expression is sometimes heard from foreigners. It's gone out of use in England, uh, the expression Oxford English, Oxford accent. Uh, received pronunciation is not localizable geographically in that way. And this, of course, corresponds historically to the phenomenon of the public schools, so-called private schools, uh, taking their pupils from many different parts of the country and imposing a kind of standard because they're boarding schools mo mainly and uh, all young people's institutions tend to be strongly standardizing. And uh, so the public schools historically, and to a large extent still, do uh, provide the motor for maintaining received pronunciation. That then is a kind of socioeconomic way of defining RP, to say that it's the speech of the people towards the top <coughs> of the social scale, the people who don't have recognizable local accents. It doesn't quite correspond in saying educated English English. In fact, it certainly doesn't correspond to that because many, many educated people have local accents to some extent. They have uh, some degree of colouring corresponding to where they come from. And this, of course, reflects the fact that uh, educated people are not exclusively drawn from the topmost social classes. Certainly not. And the <coughs> increased social mobility, <coughs> fluidity that we've seen particularly in this century, particularly since the Second World War, with a great deal of uh, movement between social classes, a general breakdown of a sharp division into social classes. This all means that uh, it 
difficult to draw a line under RP to say at what point something ceases to be part of received pronunciation. There is a great unsolved problem, therefore, of circumscribing RP and saying where its boundaries lie. Well, another quite different approach is to say, what do English people consider to be the correct way of pronouncing their language? You will sometimes see advertisements for personnel in the press which say things like wanted, uh, salesman, etc., etc., must be well-spoken. <laughs> now, the question is, what does well-spoken mean? Partly, no doubt, it does refer to uh, the ability to speak fluently, clearly, not to mumble, but I'm sure, very largely, that's a covert way of saying must speak something like received pronunciation, must not have a strong local accent, must speak in a way that's considered correct. Certainly, English society as a whole has quite strong views about correctness in language, including in pronunciation. For example, everybody agrees that it's wrong to say ot instead of hot. Now, there are millions of people who do normally say ot instead of hot, but they agree, as well as everybody else, they agree that they ought to say hot, <laughs> because that is recognized as the standard pronunciation with an H. And, you know, uh, the school teacher for children as young as seven or eight may well correct a child who says, I've hurt my hand, and tell him he should say, I've hurt my hand, with the H is pronounced, because H dropping is disapproved of overtly. So another approach, you see, is to say received pronunciation is that ideal of pronunciation that's considered correct. Again, this tends to sort of collapse into incoherence because uh, there are some things about we, which people have no views or which don't evoke strong feelings one way or the other. What I have done uh, on the handout is list uh, a number of phonetic variables where uh, we get different results according to what criteria we take. The first of these is uh, smoothing. Remember we discussed words like fire or far, and the other example here given here, going on going. <coughs> smoothing being this tendency when we have a diphthong followed by a weak vowel to lose the second part of the diphthong, thus saying going rather than saying going. And similarly, far and science and power and so on, rather than fire, science, power. Now, what what do we say about this? Does RP have smoothing? Well, any socioeconomic approach says, let's see what people at the top of the social scale do in this respect. And it's a simple matter of observation that they do do smoothing. So there's no question about it. Yes, it is part of it. If, on the other hand, we ask, what is considered to be the correct pronunciation? Tell me, what is the right way to say this word? Oh, you should say, going. How is this word pronounced? Fire. In our special, slow, careful, deliberate, special citation form pronunciation, we don't do smoothing. So here there's a, a discrepancy, therefore, between these two types of criteria. The third possible set of criteria is the one I've headed EFL. And this is one, perhaps, that you might be more interested in, but it's uh, perhaps less relevant for native speakers. And this is the view that we need a codified standard to teach English pronunciation when we're teaching English as a foreign language. And because Daniel Jones and his followers have done this work of codifying received pronunciation, it's described in textbooks, it's recorded in dictionaries and so on, received pronunciation is what we normally take as the standard to teach. And so we ask ourselves, what is in our codified standard? Do we prescribe smoothing? What do we teach in, this, in the classroom? Well, in the classroom, on the whole, we teach the same as our careful citation form, go, going, gone. This is a fire. So we have to say that no smoothing in 
EFLR. We get similar discrepancy if we take the next uh, variable that I listed here, the next uh, process, that's R intrusion, the use of intrusive R. Remember I discussed this with reference to phrases like put a comma in. Is that RP with a R pronounced at this point, comma in. Well, an objective investigation of the actual behavior of people towards the top of the social scale has to say, yes, people do normally pronounce this with an R, with a comma. There's a minority of speech conscious people and so on who have drilled themselves not to do it, but they are a minority and uh, most people usually do it. On the other hand, if you ask them explicitly, ought you to pronounce an R in here? Oh, certainly not. That's very bad. Uh, indeed, many people who do it themselves would condemn it and probably not even be aware that they do do it. People are very obtuse about this. They don't realize what they do in their own pronunciation. This is why we have quite a job teaching English phonetics not only to foreign learners but also to native English people. There is a big job of teaching, about, teaching them about the phonetics of their own language because it's not obvious to native speakers how they pronounce their own language. They know about the letters and the spelling but they don't know about the sounds. <coughs> so you have this uh, remarkable phenomenon of people objecting to mispronunciation and slovenly this and slovenly that, and yet you hear them using these intrusive R's uh, because that's part of what we normally do. So a mismatch again between socioeconomic fact and ideal. What do we do for EFL? Well, the tradition has been to say not to do it. I mean, it would be an extra teaching point if we had to teach you to do it because there's no R in the spelling. I sometimes wonder if the time has not come that we ought to teach you to do it, as I mentioned, but uh, that's not the custom so far. And certainly there's no, nothing lost by uh, ignoring the whole business, except possible, possibly uh, a problem of comprehension when native speakers use intrusive R. The third matter I've got on the handout concerns pronunciation of words like where with initial qu, thus qua, qu, quen, uh, to whine, distinct from whine, that sort of thing. Well, socioeconomic facts, people don't do it. Nobody in England says this except in the very far north uh, on the Scottish border, and of course in Scotland and in Ireland people say qua, but not in general in England. That is, not unless they have specially learnt to do so in a conscious way. There are people who are, have jobs like actors or newsreaders who may have been drilled to do this, or indeed ordinary people who are speech conscious and have learnt to do it, but it's in some sense artificial, it's not our ordinary pronunciation. Why do people make this effort to do this? Why do some newsreaders and so on say a Well, because that's the ideal, because it's the spelling with WH. They believe that's what they ought to do. Again, people are bad at consulting the spelling and thinking about the spelling. We had a news, newsreader on television a few years ago. Her name is Angela Rippon. She's now gone into wider fields of uh, work on television. But she caused great amusement by talking about a fire that had broken out in what she called a warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can see the mechanism here. That where is pronounced the same as this where in ordinary English pronunciation. If you make the effort in this frequently used word to say where instead of where, by overdoing it, you end up saying where in, in warehouse. <coughs> because it's not a natural distinction for us to make. Whereas the Scots and the Irish who say where would certainly not say where, warehouse for this. They're going to say warehouse. <coughs> Somebody's being beeped. Well, so much then for these problems in defining things. There are other difficulties concerned with change over time, which I'm not now going to go into. Perhaps we'll come and look at them at the end. Uh, in as much as uh, there's a, if you like, a point of controversy whether or not RP can ever change. There are people who take the view that Daniel Jones defined it in 1917 or whatever for all time, and that is that, and that's fixed, and nothing, nothing more can happen. 
that seems to me a silly way of defining RP because if, if that were the case, there's nobody left alive who speaks it. Uh, and it's more sensible to recognize that everything changes over time, including English and including the pronunciation of English. Right, well, that really brings us on to the next block on the handout, labeled Near RP. This is a very general uh, title for the whole lot, meaning these are some, some of the things we can discuss in defining what is and what isn't RP, uh, and also which we can discuss in looking at some of the features of not received pronunciation, which are nevertheless widespread. First of all, the problem of these words like happy. What is the final vowel in a word like happy? We agree that we've got in English a contrast between the E of beat and the E of bits. And the question is, what is it that we have as the last sound in happy? Is it like the E of beat, or is it like the E of bits? Well, it's like both of them. If you put people in a forced choice situation, that is, you oblige them to choose one or the other, put them to vote, well, then you find that some people choose one, some people choose the other. In my own ordinary pronunciation, I say happy, 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 happy. It's always seemed to me quite clear that it was the ear of bit. But I think the majority of my native speaking students, native English speaking students, choose E, happy, bit. It doesn't make any difference because we have this neutralization between them. Nevertheless, there is the general impression, which I think is correct, that RP is gradually moving from E to E. That is to say, happy used to be regarded as a vulgarism of the south of England and so on, but it's now no longer regarded as a vulgarism in this way. It's not seen as being regional. It's not seen as being incorrect. Uh, it's lost that special uh, kind of quality. This applies also for a vowel, as in happier, is it happier, or happier, various, and so on. Same kind of problem arises with plosive appendices. Again, this is something we've already talked about, I think, in class, uh, or in the lectures. This is fence becoming fence, instance becoming instance. That's a nice word because it has two instances of it in it. You get a T in there and a T in there. Instance rather than instance. Once upon a time, this might have been condemned as a Londonism or Americanism or whatever, but I think that time has now gone, and it can be recognized as part of a possible part of our team. Next point, vowel reduction. Actually, I've got a, an unsatisfactory example here. At least, let's talk about it. The, the, there's a big problem in weak syllables to decide whether we have a or whether we have it, it, a. And there are lots of words where some speakers use one and some speakers use the other. Consider, for example, this word. Some people say system. Same it in each syllable, system. Some people say system. It, uh. The one with the word on the handout. Some people say careless. Carelessness. Others say careless. Carelessness. And there is a gradual again, in RP and in English in general, from I to E uh, in various categories of words. The <coughs> choice that I've made in Longman Pronunciation Dictionary, the one that I've chosen to give first, on the whole reflects my own pronunciation. I decided that was the best thing to do. So I'm largely introspective about them because it seems to me that I am fairly in the middle of this trend, as far as I can judge. I have been attacked since the book came out, both by people who think it's very shocking and vulgar to have all these schwas around the place, and by people who say, well, it's clear the way things are moving, and what with all these Australians and people, don't you think you ought to have uh, avoided these archaic pronunciations with I that you include? So you clearly can't please everybody, and I think probably I think it's about right. But we are, we've got this continuing uh, drift from I to uh. It seems to me to be most strong adjacent to R. And this does raise certain problems of uh, complication for 
for foreign learners, take a word like angry, ends in ee, angry. What is the adverb for? Well, it's not really angry. Really. Clearly, predominant by far is with a schwa pronunciation, angrily. Angrily. This reflects the presence of this R there. This R strongly predisposes one towards it. Now that's uh, a change that Ethan Gimson introduced into EPD. But you see, we're up against this problem of RP and EFL. It's quite satisfactory from the point of view of our understanding a learner if the learner says angrily. No problem. We actually say angrily, but you can ignore that fact. And we, and we have this difficulty of deciding what we should prescribe and whether it has to correspond to what the majority of people do or what they majority of RP speakers do, or just <coughs> some quite different arbitrary codification that's convenient to teach. <coughs> this does assume that we have a contrast between weak I and schwa. And indeed, most English people do have such a contrast, as you can see by comparing a rabbit, the animal, and an abbot, a religious man who is in an abbey. And these words don't rhyme. Rabbit, abbot, rabbit, abbot. Nevertheless, there are people in England, perhaps particularly in East Anglia, but also in places like Scotland, Ireland, and America, and certainly in Australia, who have lost the distinction, who have to have rabbit and abbot rhyming. They don't have any other possibility. So it's not only that we're moving from it to er, but that the possibility of making a distinction is gradually going as well. So again, the problem is just how to fix this and where to say that we are. I would certainly say that productively there are many, many thousands of words where foreign learners can say whichever they like. Giving you that kind of freedom or license, though, isn't very popular, because it seems to me that most people want to be told what they ought to do in terms of foreign <laughs> learners. So my advice is, if you've already learned a pronunciation, stick to it. If you want one, you're not sure, then you can see what I've given in the dictionary. Let's move on to the next point, t glottally. Just received a letter from a teacher of English abroad who was telling me about some of the things that she, she teaches her students. One of the things she said is you must not pronounce two T phonemes in a phrase like the right time. I now have to write back to her and tell her that she's misusing the term phoneme, because it is correct to pronounce two T phonemes in right time, because you don't say right eye. But the point is that the two phonemes, the T in right and the T in time, are pronounced differently from one another and in special ways that require attention. Namely, the first T in right should not be exploded. Here we have a sequence of plosives, sequence of identical plosives, and as I hope you know, when this arises, we don't usually explode the first one. We don't say right time. We say right time. So we have a single kind of long plosive that bridges the gap between the two of them. You make the closure at the end of the eye, right? You hold it for rather longer than usual, then you release it with aspiration, right? Time, just like the long D in good dog, and so on and so on. That's one possibility. Increasingly, though, another possibility. And that's that the first T is pronounced as a glottal stop. That is, instead of being made with the tongue tip, it's made at the glottis by bringing the vocal folds firmly together like this, right. Nothing going on around. <coughs> right. And then right time. Is it the right time? The right time. The right time. <coughs> what this means is that Increasingly, the phoneme T is sometimes realized, sometimes pronounced, as a glottal rather than as an alveolar plosive. <coughs> this is, in fact, very general 
when we have a word that ends in T like right, and the next word begins with a consonant. The stronger the consonant, the more likely that the T will be glottal. So that if this consonant is a plosive, it's really very likely. The right dirty, the right person, the right book, the right kind, the right girl, all would be through all the plosives, all with the advocates, the right chair, the right judge. All those, glottal stop is very usual. People uh, don't notice it, we say, at all. Before fricatives, not perhaps quite so widespread, but still very general, <coughs> the right view, the right size, the right shape. Certainly that's my usual pronunciation. I can carefully say the right shape, the right size, but I don't usually do that. I say the right shape, the right size. Before nasal, the right man, the right, what we have with N, of the word, nest, the right nest, silly word, <coughs> the right name. There again, there is the possibility of saying the right man, with an exploded T, usually with that nasal release noise, right man, the right name. That's what Daniel Jones prescribes and describes, the right name, nasally released T. Now very much a minority pronunciation, the right man, the right name. <coughs> so much so that uh, I've taken to using non-use of glottal stop as a way of recognizing people with particular regional accents. <coughs> for example, non-use of glottal stops for T is very characteristic of some Welsh speakers of it's also characteristic of uh, foreigner talk. And that reminds me that somebody in one of the questionnaires was uh, rather upset at what they took as the ethnocentric and uh, arrogant view of some of your teachers making rude remarks about the way foreigners pronounce. Well, I don't know what they said, and I hope it wasn't uh, the way you describe it, but it, it's possible that what we have here is a misunderstanding and that this was merely an attempt describe the reaction that people do have to hearing foreign accents rather than poking fun of the foreign accents as such. And this is a good case in point. It is the case that most foreign learners of English use an alveolar T in all environments. And it is the case that most English people don't. So this is one of the things that can be used as a recognition factor. Sometimes, you know, when we get people who are very good at English, you'll hear remarks like, his English was so perfect, I knew he couldn't be English. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would fit in with the view that the correct pronunciation is alveolar, but we know that in practice most English people use it on stop. What about when the following consonant is weaker still? If it's a, a, a liquid, uh, the right light, the right race, the right reason. There again, we're gradually getting more and more sort of noticeable. I think people will often say the right reason, you hear a trip there, but the right reason is very widespread as well. When it's a yod or a w, uh, the right year, the right way, then again in ordinary casual speech you readily hear those glottal stops. The crunch comes when the next word begins with a vowel, as in the example on the handout, right on. Now that's something that, for example, doesn't belong in my speech. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say the right idea or right on, but the right idea and right on. Nevertheless, I'm becoming conscious that people who are 30 years younger than me and otherwise have a similar background to myself can be heard using glottal stops in this position sometimes, even before vowels. So this shows again this is an ongoing process. Uh, I mean, my retired colleague, Dr. Pring, who is now in his 70s, was a lecturer in the department when I was a student in it. He disapproved of my use of glottal stops. He thought that was very vulgar and slovenly <laughs> and not really right. What he would think of today's young people, I, I shudder to think. <laughs> well, 
I don't think it's sensible to take that attitude because, as I say, languages change and one just has to accept this fact. What is uh, <coughs> strange and slovenly pronunciation of today's young people will be the norm and the standard of the next centuries. Right, the next set of things are more noticeably regional. In a number of words, perhaps 60 or 70 common words, of which Bath is a good example, we have a difference between a possible pronunciation Bath, which is the received pronunciation form, and also general in the south of England, versus a vowel that's shorter, somewhat fronter, Bath, which is general in the north of England. So in the south, we ask questions. In the north, you ask questions. Have you noticed this pronunciation from any of your lecturers or teachers in the present class, in the present course? No. Who? Well, I don't know. Maybe they corrected it when addressing you. But there are certainly some of them who sometimes use this pronunciation. Uh, because it's not considered uneducated or anything, it's merely considered northern. It's not quite received pronunciation. Here we have this difficult matter again. In the north of England, you really have to be right up towards the top or very sort of uh, RP oriented to talk about a bath rather than a bath. Some people sort of fluctuate between the two of them. And uh, it's therefore something that I've included in the dictionary, but with a special mark against it to say that it's regional. The Americans, of course, also have a short vowel bath, and so they provide an extra sort of reinforcement for the, for the northerners with that. Uh, can't is actually a special case because that's an in American, but not on the whole in the north of England. Uh, ask certain ears now. L vocalization. Now, is this or is this not part of RP? Ginson reckons that adjacent to labials, it, it is. That is that when you've got a, a, a labial next to the L, you can get a pronunciation that instead of involving the tongue tip, with concomitant raising of the back of the tongue, dark L, myself, can be made entirely with the back of the tongue, not using the tongue tip, thus myself. Can you hear that? Myself, not using the tongue tip. That's what L vocalization is. It's losing the alveolar component of dark L. Now, just remind yourselves about clear and dark L. We've got these two varieties of L thrown in in RP, clear L, which is used before vowels, and dark L, which is used before consonants and uh, absolute final position. So before a vowel, let, look, valley, filling, dark L before a consonant, film, shelf, milk, and in absolute final position, bell, call, and so on. It's the dark L that is becoming vocal. What happens in London speech, for example, in Cockney, is that we get a kind of all vowel. <coughs> Thus, in a word like milk, dark L, we get instead a kind of new diphthong, an ill diphthong. Thus, milk, milk, milk. And this is not a table, but a table, table, ball, ball. This is the middle of the table, middle. Well, shocking developments, but there we are. It's, uh, it's gradually seeping into RP or near RP. Perhaps in a restricted range of environments to begin with. You seem to a teacher being interviewed on the radio this morning. He kept talking about schools. My reaction, <coughs> my age and my background, is what a vulgar pronunciation. Instead of calling them schools, he was speaking of schools. Schools, without an L in it, you see. School, <laughs> school, with this vocalization, the L getting swallowed up in the O. But it's clearly the pronunciation of the future. Milk bill, but milk bill. <coughs> Closing diphthongs. Many of the differences between different accents of English, the kinds of things that we as native speakers are very acutely aware of, Concerns subtle differences in the qualities of vowels. A 
that's why we quite rightly tell foreign earners to ignore the whole problem. If I say price, that's my view of RP. If I say price, that's my view of a northern accent. If I say price, that's my view of a southern accent. If I say price, that's my view of a Scottish accent. And so on. But I don't know how easy you find it to hear the differences between all of those. They're not very different, but they're enough to elicit these reactions in us. In the case of mouth, it's even more strong. I say mouth, mouth is what I think of as the norm, because I always regard my own pronunciation as the norm. Uh, if I hear somebody say mouth, mouth, or even worse, if they say mouth, then I think that's southern. If I hear someone say mouth, I think aha, West Indian. If I hear someone say mouth, I think Scottish or possibly Canadian, and so on. These things are all very varied. With the A and O vowels, again, quite sharp differences. RP generally reckoned to be face, face, face. Andrew Jones might have said something more like face, face, rather tenser than is now the norm. Londoners say something much laxer, face. It's more face, isn't it? <coughs> All right, face. And uh, this is what you can hear in uh, Scotland or in some parts of Wales and so on. Similarly with goat. RP now usually goat. If I hear goat, goat, that's old fashioned. Uh, perhaps somebody like John Gielgud, uh, actor, certainly aged over 60. If I hear goat, that's halfway to being London, etc. Goat. If I hear goat, that's Scottish and so on. Wide differences there. Centric diphthongs, near, near. If I hear something like near, that's got a, a touch of the south to me, amongst other possibilities, closer quality to begin with. Square. Quite a few people say square with a monophone, air. You can argue whether or not that needs to be included within RP. It probably can be included as a casual variant, though not a citation form. But there are people, for example, in the Birmingham area for whom square is the citation form with a clear monophone. For others, again, who say square, and that's a Liverpool accent. Poor. Well, that's one of the words in my opinion poll, because as well as the classic poor, we've got a newer RP form, poor. And you can look up the figures. They came out more or less half and half between the two of them. Looking at it according to different age groups, there's a clear tendency that the younger you are, the more likely you are to say poor. The older you are, the more likely to say poor. There are people who are even further behind in this change and say poor, but that's clearly perceived as regional. <coughs> I didn't include among the centering diphthongs there a possible centering diphthong or. And yet, a hundred years ago, we clearly had to recognize an or distinct from an or. This, after all, is why the <coughs> tradition exists in Japanese English of saying one, two, three, four. This is an attempt to reproduce this. And it reflects the pronunciation of 100 years ago when people <laughs> said four rather than four that we now have because we have lost the diphthong or. It's fallen in with or. And so, for example, we now have identical pronunciations for these two words, the floor that I'm standing on and the floor in a diamond. I'm putting that to you from the point of view of received pronunciation. Of course, there are people who retain this distinction, but it's now a, a regional, a provincial sort of thing to distinguish them. Next point, no R dropping. Not only the Americans and the Scots and the Irish, but also some people in the west of England retain historical R wherever it's written in the spelling. So say short rather than short, and war rather than war. But that has to be called not quite RP, although it needn't be very far off RP. The last point here, the vowel in words like strut or love and so on. Wherever RP has the R vowel, in some regional accents you get a stressed schwa, that's love, strut. Typical of uh, uh, Welsh English or Midlands. And others again 
have a vowel like the u of good and say stood and loved, and that's typical of the north of England. People who have a northern accent in this respect and uh, become sort of aware of the RP arrangement sometimes get into frightful muddles trying to make their accents sound less regional. If you grow up in the north of England saying love, you become aware that it's posh to change love to art, so to change love to love. And instead of drinking out of a cup, you learn to drink out of a cup. But then there's a difficulty with a phrase like good luck. <laughs> Do you see? Because you start off with good luck, and unless you're very careful, you find yourself saying gun luck, or worse still, gun luck, uh, <laughs> instead of good luck. You have to choose which ones to change and which ones to keep the same. It's very difficult to do if you start off with a, a northern accent in this connection. Those are some of the most striking regional features of pronunciation that you will hear. And we'll, in each case, we have to make a decision as to how far to include this sort of thing uh, as part of received pronunciation. The two things listed on the three on the handout are examples of clearly not received pronunciation, but perhaps the two most widespread things. We've already talked about H dropping just briefly. Let me point out the other one, which is the pronunciation of this ing ending. Ending, ending. <coughs> in uh, non received pronunciation, that is in working class pronunciation, pronunciation that's considered incorrect, vulgar pronunciation, you get an alveolar nasal for the ing ending. So instead of running and walking, you get running and walking. Uh, in a word like eating, it can be eaten, but very often you get just eaten. So you lose the distinction, in fact, between eating and eaten. They both come out the same. This is found virtually everywhere in the English-speaking world, and virtually everywhere there is this social distinction with a correct or high or upper ing form and an incorrect stigmatized low n form. Again, it gives rise to hypercorrections, problems. If you start off with this, you tend to overdo the correction. So uh, a good example is the name badminton, where you will hear people say badminton, because that seems more elegant in the same way as Kensington, yet more elegant than Kensington. <laughs> That's something to worry the native speakers perhaps you are with more than the foreign parents. Well, I think I've more or less used up my time, so I won't talk about specific lexical items, because I've already talked about this anyhow, and they're in the dictionary as well as the opinion. I hope to finish then by hoping that what we've taught you has proved useful and will continue to prove useful. We've obviously given you much too much information in two and a half weeks. What you must now do is go home, sit down, and have time to absorb it all and digest what we have covered you with, force fed you with during the course. Thank you all very much.